each institution. As is well known to all of us, Professor Bose was one of the greatest Indian mathematician and physicist specializing in theoretical physics. He is best known for his work on quantum mechanics in the early 1920s, collaborating with Albert Einstein in developing the foundation for Bose-Einstein statistics and the theory of Bose-Einstein condensation. The class of particles that obey Bose-Einstein statistics boson was named after Bose by Paul Dirac. Besides physics, he had a wide range of interests in different fields, including mathematics, chemistry, biology, physiology, arts, literature, and music. He was well versed in several languages such as Bengali, English, French, German, and Sanskrit, as well as the poetry of Lord Tennyson, Rabindranath Tagore, and Kalidas. He could play the Esraj and Indian musical instrument. He devoted a significant time to promoting Bengali as a teaching language, translating scientific papers into it, and promoting the development of science in the region. To achieve this goal, Bongyo began Porishad, a pioneer science organization for cultivation and popularization of science and scientific knowledge was founded in the year 1948 by collective effort of all the eminent scientists and educationists of Bengal under his leadership. The history of Parishad since inception illustrates how a powerful social movement, namely the science movement, generated out of the ideas and values of such organization. Professor Bose was honored with title Padda Vibhushan by the Indian government in 1954. In 1959, he was appointed as a national professor, the highest honor in the country for a scholar, a position he held for 15 years. Bose became an advisor to the to then newly formed Council of Science and Industrial Research, CSIR. He was the president of the Indian Physical Society and the National Institute of Science. He was elected general president of the Indian Science Congress. He was the vice president and then the president of Indian Statistical Institute. In 1958, he became a fellow of the Royal Society. SN Bose was nominated several times for the Nobel Prize in Physics for its outstanding contribution to physics by developing both Einstein statistics and the unified field theory. In recent years, this statistics is found to be the profound importance in the classification of the fundamental particles and has contributed immensely to the development of nuclear physics. It is unfortunate that finally he was not bestowed with the honor. When Bose himself was once asked that question, he simply replied, I have got all the recognition I deserve probably because in the realms of science to which he belonged, what is important is not a Nobel, but whether one's name will live on in scientific discussion in the decades now. He left for his heavenly abode on 4th February, February, 1974. So with this short note, I would like to now invite Professor Dipankar Bhattacharya to please introduce our speaker and start the program. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. First of all, I must thank the uh, Department of Physics uh, and uh, the team working for the, this uh, program to make it uh, really a success. I thank all of you for the initiative. And I thank uh, Professor Naran Banerjee. Uh, sir, you were on mute. Mm -hmm. uh, it's OK. Uh, it's Pleasure for all of us. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, you are yes. audible. Yes, sir, you are audible. So, yes, you, so it's really a pleasure for us to have Professor Naran Banerjee with us. And uh, just uh, I would like to say a few words about him. Professor Naran Banerjee, who was associated with various academic institutions in India, such as Soros Centenary College, Ugli, 1986. Sipat Singh College, Mushidabad, then Jadapur University, and uh, since uh, 2008, he is associated with Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, commonly known as Isar Kolkata, and currently he is a professor at Department of Physical Sciences, Isar Kolkata. He is alumni of Presidency College. Uh, for his uh, graduation BSc, then Calcutta University for his master's, and Jadapur University, he did his PhD from Jadapur University. 
His current research interest is on gravitation and cosmology. Presently, he is working on models of dark energy, the driver of the alleged accelerated expansion of the universe, quantum cosmology, and problems on gravitational collapse and formation of black holes. In 2002, he was elected as Secretary, Indian Association for General Relativity and Gravitation. And he was the president uh, for the period 2002 to 2006, Indian Association for General Relativity and Gravitation. He has authored many articles in reputed international journals. So it's our pleasure to have uh, Professor Naran Banerjee with us. Sir, now the stage is all yours. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. And I thank the organizers. Uh, and Papia got in touch with me and asked me to come. So I agreed. Uh, so it was a pleasure to. Uh, so I visited Iramas University once for a conference along with some of my friends. It was a nice uh, visit, I would say. Uh, so uh, I was keen on going to the university once more, but, uh, but for the, uh, I mean, the weather situation not permitting, this talk is. Uh, online, for which I am not too confident, but let's see how it goes. But before I share my screen, let me also add a few words uh, on SN Bose. So I am in IIACR Kolkata, which is housed in uh, uh, the municipality of Horinghata, very close to Jaguli Mode, Jaguli Crossing, which is a place on the National Highway 34, the way to Siliguri from Kolkata. In fact, Satyendranath Bose spent quite a few years in Jaguli. In some, maybe this was his maternal uncle's place, and he went to some school here as well. Uh, so uh, every year in January, close to Professor Essen Bose's birthday, so Jaguli, they have a very big science festival. In his name, so so IISR Kolkata in that way is associated with SN Bose quite closely. I mean, at least geographically. So, uh, and today's talk, I shall be talking about the cosmology, what cosmology is all about. But I shall begin with SN Bose's impact on cosmology as well. So, let me share my screen and let's see how it goes. So the organizers have to allow me to share my screen. They say that you have the host disabled attendee screen sharing. Kuba, please check. You have to allow yes, me sir. to share my yes, screen. Sir. Yes, Can you please check now? Yeah, I shall. It's not happening. Is it coming? Uh, not yet, sir. Yes, sir, I guess so. Uh, can you please share once again? Yes, sir, I can uh, see your screen. Yeah, good. No, no, the screen. Yes. Then that's, yeah, yes. now it's yes, good. Yes, yeah. Good. 
Yeah. So I would like to how to no this is i am trying to go to the full screen mode anyway this will work so well so the topic of the uh, talk as we have already said is our universe i shall talk about the universe that we see around us uh <coughs> So moving. So the universe is our habitat, and it is composed of everything that we see around us. We have seen in the past, we can see now, or we expect to see in any foreseeable future. Consists of the universe, like stars, galaxies, cluster of galaxies, and all that uh, uh, are, the, are the are the constituents of the universe. So so something about the scale of the universe. So uh, when we talk about the universe, the galaxies are the building blocks. Like when we see a material, atoms and molecules are the building blocks for the universe, the galaxies will be treated to be the building blocks. So our location is called the Milky Way, a typical galaxy of a linear size of about uh, 10 to the power 5 light years. And two galaxies separated by a distance of 10 to the power 6 light years are very, very close neighbors. So that is the scale of things that we are talking about. And our locality is uh, called the solar system. The sun is a typical star. Our galaxy contains about 100 billion stars, 10 to the power 11 stars. And the mass of our galaxy is about 100 billion solar mass. So as you can easily see, we, uh, so our, the sun, our the sun is a very typical average star. Not very big, not very small either. So if we look at a much smaller scale, we can find atoms, molecules, energy in the form of radiation and whatnot. Uh, and to look at the for, look for the abundance of various things, we need to look at different places. Actually, we need to look uh, at different scales of uh, size. But what is omnipresent? What we can find everywhere in the universe is a black body radiation in the microwave region at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. So this is found everywhere in the universe and in all directions, equally. So this is a black body radiation, as I said. So you can re recall the black body radiation spectrum looks like somewhat like this. On the y-axis, the intensity in some arbitrary scale. And on the y-axis, we have the wavelength. So, so we have a peak almost a Gaussian structure with a long tail on the right hand side. And with temperature, higher the temperature, the higher the peak is. Yeah, so this is the black body radiation spectrum. And where lambda times T lambda is the wavelength times temperature is a constant. So black body radiation is given by this, uh, the picture is given by this formula, what is known as Planck's formula, the energy density emitted per unit time is 8 pi nu square, nu is the frequency, divided by c cube, c is the speed of light in vacuum, times h nu divided by e to the power h nu over kt minus 1. This e to the power h nu over kt minus 1 in the denominator comes from what is known as uh, the Bose distribution, which we shall come to. This is the energy distribution per unit time, energy density emitted per unit time. And H2 is the transfer of energy between matter and radiation. So, well, and Shotanarad Bosch, uh, who was uh, born in 1994 and passed away in 1974, gave, derived this formula by using a distribution law called this Bose distribution formula. This is a distribution the probability of finding a boson that is a particle with integral spin will be given by 1 over e to the power energy divided by kt. k is the Boltzmann constant, t is the temperature, minus 1. 
So you can see for energy is equal to zero, capital E is equal to zero. We have a or we have a, a one minus one kind of a business. So at the very at very low energy, we have an intense uh, population of bosons, which is now known as Bose condensation. So this is the formula which was used by Essen Bose to derive Planck's formula, and that gave a natural uh, deduction of Planck's formula. So, as usual, uh, the, in physics, we normally what we do, uh, we uh, idealize certain things. We have a model on some ideal assumptions, and with this idealization, we arrive at some formula. So, this blackboard radiation formula derived by Planck, derived by Planck, is also an idealization. But we need to have some examples which is close to that. Which is the example, which example we can find in nature? The closest example that you can find in nature is the radiation that we talked about, the cosmic microwave background radiation that is found all over the universe equally in all directions, which is called CMBR. Let me try to have the full screen. Anyway, anyway, uh, I cannot. So this will do. Uh, so uh, I, I shall give you the picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation that I talked about. This is uh, indeed a black body radiation formula. Uh, this comes from the black body radiation formula. But this particular picture is not derived, not drawn from the formula. It is derived or this is drawn from the observations on the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And for every observational thing, you need to specify the error bars. You can see the error bars appearing in the picture and they, believe it or not, they are 400 times magnified. So the most exact example of the Planck formula, which is derived by SN Bose using his distribution of bosons, the best example, in fact, an exact fit to the formula is found everywhere in the universe in the form of cosmic microwave background radiation. So a brief history of its discovery, I need to talk about its discovery. We need to turn towards the evolution of the universe, our habitat. So it, we have to go back to 1929 when Hubble's, for Hubble's observation, Hubble, Edwin Hubble discovered that the galaxies are moving away from each other. And the velocity of recession between two galaxies, V is equal to H into D, <coughs> where H is a constant called Hubble constant. Now we know that it's not a constant, it's rather called a parameter, and D is the distance separating two galaxies. The, so. If, if there are velocity, if there is a velocity between two galaxies and the galaxies constitute the universe, we have to find, we have to decide or we have to conclude that the universe is actually expanding. How does Hubble get into that? So, so look at this picture. If there is a source of radiation and an observer and there is a relative motion between the source and the observer, there is a change in the frequency. If the source and observer, they're moving away from each other, then the wavelength is increased. We call it a redshift. And if the source and observer move towards each other, there is a fall in the wavelength or increase in the frequency, which we'll call the blue shift. Hubble found that there is a redshift in the universe. Redshift is the fractional increase in the wavelength. And it is known from class 11 book, we all know this delta lambda by lambda, the fractional increase in the wavelength of the, of the wave is proportional to the velocity. And Hubble found that the z, this redshift, is proportional to distance. And hence, the velocity is proportional to distance. So the galaxies are moving away from each other with some velocity, which is proportional to the distance between the galaxies. So, right. right. So now, 
So, a few words about this Edwin Hubble, this gentleman. Uh, he was a bit uh, older than S. N. Bose. He was born in 1889 and passed away in 1953. Uh, he was a very colorful man. Hubble worked at Mount Wilson at California. He got a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Chicago in 1910. And he had been in the first batch of the recipient of the Rhodes Scholarships at Oxford University, where he learned jurisprudence, that is law. But apparently, he never practiced law. Very quickly, he, he found that this is not his cup of tea. So he moved, to, uh, moved his major to Spanish language. He did not continue there as well. He was a gifted sportsman, got a record in high jump at school level, and he was also known for boxing. He was a middleweight boxing champion. So you can see that he was a very colorful man. Uh, anyway, he got his PhD in 1917 from Chicago University in astronomy and got back to Mount Wilson and got, uh, yeah, uh, Mount Wilson in California for his future work. So he joined Mount Wilson in 1919 and worked with the newly built Hooker telescope. It was a 100 inch optical telescope and it remained the biggest telescope for 25 years to come. This is a picture of Hooker's telescope uh, in Mount Wilson. So, so this was all about Hubble. So how do we now we know that the universe is expanding. So as we know, normally, if you look at the night sky, you will find that the universe remains the same. Yes, there are some periodic motion in the stars and galaxies, but every year at the same part of the year, you will see the same st stars, same galaxies, same constellations at the same place. So we normally uh, think that the universe more or less remains the same. There are periodic motions, but they repeat themselves. There is no uh, evolution of the universe as such. But Hubble's discovery uh, tells us, no, the universe is actually evolving, it is expanding. So you need to have some theoretical model for it. The, the model looks like this. The universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Homogeneous means the universe looks same at all points, and isotropic means it looks the same in all directions. This is an observational fact. Uh, you can say that, see, we can see a some star here, some star there, one galaxy here and another galaxy quite far, and there is almost nothing in between. So how can you say that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic? You are right, but you think about the scale. If you look at a distance of 10 to the power 6 light years, you will see that some inhomogeneity and anisotropy. But if you look at a large scale, the, uh, let's say a volume of radius 10 to the power 7 light years, you will see the total number of galaxies in that volume will be the same everywhere you look at. This is somewhat similar to, let's say, uh, a, a gas. Suppose in a container you have a gas, you say that gas is uniform, meaning that the density is same everywhere. But from kinetic theory model, you know that the total volume of the molecules is negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas. So you, there is one molecule here, and there is another molecule there, and the space between them, there you have nothing. But if you pick up one cubic centimeter of volume everywhere from the uh, gas, you will see the total number of molecules in the, uh, the, the molecules are coming and going, but on the average, total number of molecules in one cubic centimeter is the same everywhere in the container. So in this way, the universe is also homogeneous and isotropic. The matter content in the universe is in the form of a fluid. That is an assumption. It's called the hydrodynamic approximation. So we know that the galaxies are the building blocks that I told you before. So the galaxies will be treated to be the molecules of this fluid. And the correct theory of gravity is general relativity. This is also crucial because we know that, that there are basically four kinds of interactions that we talk about in physics. One is a strong interaction, which is responsible for the nucleons to form nuclei. Protons, although they are same charge, they do not. They, they should repel each other, but they are close together because of this force, strong force. Then there are weak force, which is responsible for the beta decay. There is electromagnetic interaction, and the fourth is gravity. And gravity is by far, by far, 
the weakest of this interaction. But strong and weak forces are very, very short range forces. Uh, and the universe, the scale of the universe, we are already aware of. And in this large scale, only two kinds of interactions are valid or are, uh, are in fact um, sizable. One is electromagnetic interaction, the other is general, other is gravity. But the universe as a whole is electrically neutral. So gravity is the only dominant universe which governs the dynamics of the universe. So we need a theory of gravity. And at this point, we choose general relativity as the theory of gravity, which was given by Einstein. This is not a place of talking about general relativity, but I shall, but I shall very briefly tell you what is all about. Albert Einstein gave that theory in 1915. Uh, and he said that gravity will be given or, or, or will be manifested by the geometry of space-time. So he write an equation. He writes an equation. Geometry is equal to matter with some kappa coming in, which takes care of the dimensional consideration. And the, so matter will de determine the ge geometry. And the geometry will give you the trajectory of the particles in gravity. Somewhat like I can give you an analogy, which was used by our teacher, great teacher, Professor Amol Kumar Rai Choudhury. He said that if you go to your uh, Barashat station and ask a mathematician, can you tell me the trajectory of this train? He will immediately say, of course, yes. So I can tell you about the trajectory of the train. I have to solve the Newton's law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. It's a second order differential equation. You need to give me the force and the initial conditions. I shall integrate the equation twice and tell you the trajectory of the, of the train. You will uh, say that the mathematicians know so much. But if you ask a porter, how to, so uh, can, you, can, can you tell me what should be the uh, trajectory of this train? The porter will say, don't you see the train line? The train will follow that train line. So the effect of gravity is to lay the train lines, rails, through which uh, the train car will move or the, any, any particle will move under the influence of gravity. So these uh, rail lines in gravity are called geodesics. We shall not talk about that in any detail here. But anyway, with this general relativity, we can model the universe, uh, as I said, with two more assumptions. One is the homogeneity and isotropy. The universe looks the same in all directions and at all points. And also, uh, the, uh, the hydrodynamic approximation that the universe is given by a fluid. So for a fluid, we know that there is an equation of state which relates pressure with density. If we talk about the two extreme equations of state, one in which the pressure is zero, then the scale factor which determines the linear size of the universe is found to be proportional to t to the power two thirds, where t is time, kind of the age of the universe. And for radiation, the other extreme case, where the pressure is very high, as high as rho by three, you can say that rho and p, pressure and density, they are not dimensionally same. So in fact, we have chosen a unit where c, the speed of light is equal to one. The equation should have been p is equal to rho c square by 3, but we have chosen, it's very typical to choose these gravitational units in general relativity. c is equal to 1, and also capital G, the Newtonian constant of gravity is equal to 1. So p is equal to rho by 3. If you choose this equation of state, you will find that a is proportional to square root of t, t to the power half. For both cases, the volume of the universe if A gives you the linear size of the universe, then A cube will, of course, give you the volume of the universe. Goes to zero as, as uh, T goes to zero. Well, so you can see that at T is equal to zero, A is, zero, A is equal to zero, and hence A cube is also equal to zero for both these cases. All the cases generally will, be, will fall in between them. And for all of them, you can check that uh, the universe uh, will have a zero in volume uh, at some t is equal to zero. So, in fact, this model that we talked about now came seven years before Hubble's observation. 
Hubble observed this in 1929, if you remember, as I said. And Friedman model, this model of the universe came in 1922 using Einstein's general relativity, in, uh, which was given in 1915. So Friedman model gives you the universe is expanding against the everyday observations. And uh, so theoretical model was there before the actual observation by Hubble in 1929. In fact, Einstein, when Friedman gave this model before Hubble's observation, Einstein himself did not believe it. He thought that the universe should be stationary. So he introduced something which is called a cosmological constant and he made an attempt to, to find uh, a, a, a static universe as a solution of his uh, equation of general relativity. But in 1929, after Hubble's discovery, Einstein had to admit that the introduction of the cosmological constant was the greatest blunder of his life. His original equation, general relativity, was correct. That gives the evolution of the universe very correctly. So, we shall have a very close, I mean, a very quick look at the evolution of the universe. So the universe is expanding, the galaxies are moving away from each other. So if you look back in time, the galaxies were closer together, look further back, they were even closer together. So if you do this continuously, at some point in the past, some time in the past, everything was concentrated in a zero volume, right? So, so we started from a zero volume. The evolution of the universe, all the structure cannot be stored in the zero volume. You can see galaxies, even two chalks cannot be st stored in a zero volume. So the whole of these galaxies cannot be, cannot be stored in a zero volume. So everything was in the form of energy at that time at a very, very high temperature, infinite density. If you believe in the matter and energy conservation, we know that from Einstein taught us in 1905 by his special theory of relativity that matter and energy, they're the same thing, different manifestations of the same physical quantity or the same physical entity, uh, uh, they're basically the same thing. So everything was in the form of energy at a very high temperature and the density of this was infinity. So the universe evolved to the present state of affairs where we see galaxies, various structures over a period of almost 14 giga years, 13.7 into 10 to the power 9 years. So it started, as I said, from a very high temperature. It cooled down and expanded to a linear size of about 10 giga light years in the process. And in the process, it formed particles first, and then it became transparent. First of all, it was all energy that is only photons and the photons collided with the particles. They could not travel very far. So the universe was opaque. At some point of time, the density became very low and after forming the particles, so the photons could travel up to infinity and we could see the past. So the universe became transparent. It formed nuclei then, that is nuclei of atoms, hydrogen first, then helium, lithium, etc., and other nuclei and then it formed stars and galaxies. So this is the evolution of the universe. This is called the standard big standard cosmological model, popularly known as the Big Bang model. Somebody will be uh, saying that it's a Big Bang theory. I should say that there is a subtle difference. The theory is still the general relativity. This should be called the Big Bang model. The universe had a beginning and that too from a singular state of infinite density because density is Energy divided, total energy divided by volume. If the volume is zero, the, the density would be infinity. So, but this Big Bang model explains various things. First of all, it explains Hubble's observation. Hubble's, Hubble discovered that the universe is actually expanding. It solved Olbers paradox, which I should, I should spend a minute on that, Olbers paradox, and also abundance of light elements. So Olbers paradox is an age-old paradox which tells you that if you are here and you look at the night sky, we can see that the night sky is quite dark. But Olbers, Olbers had an intensity integral which where he said that you collect 
the light rays from various stars and galaxies, various light sources. So a simple calculation, if the universe is static, you'll be able to show that the, uh, that the intensity that you receive per unit time will be infinity. But it is not at all infinity. The night sky is quite dark. It's quite finite. So an expanding universe, with an expanding universe, you can resolve that problem. If the light sources are going away from you, you can show that the intensity integral converges. And if it converges to a finite value, you can adjust parameters to have a, a desired intensity. And also it uh, explains the abundance of light nuclei. What is that? So you can, you can estimate the amount of light nuclei that you have in the universe. Light, light nuclei meaning the, the uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, like that. But the astrophysically estimated uh, abundance of light elements is much more than the theoretically predicted value. If you talk about a Big Bang kind of a model, an expanding universe, you can correctly arrive at the observed abundance of light elements. So these are the great success of, of uh, the Big Bang model. Now we come to the other thing where we started from black body radiation of SN Bose. Alpha, Bethe and Gamow in 1949 they published a paper and many other researchers were also working on the evolution of the universe with the help of the Big Bang model where the universe started from an infinite density and evolved to the present state of affairs at the present moment. Alpha, Bethe and Gamow, look at the names carefully, Alpha, Bethe and Gamow. Uh, so George Gamow, you may, may have heard of him. George Gamow was a famous Russian mathematician and physicist. He worked in America though. Uh, and he published very nice books, popular books like 1, 2, 3, Infinity, Mr. Tompkins in the Wonderland, etc. And he was a fun-loving gentleman. He said, henceforth, this paper will be called the Alpha, Beta, Gamma of Cosmology. Alpha, Beta and Gamma. Alpha, Beta, Gamma Cosmology. Apparently, there is a story that Bethe did not contribute. Hans Bethe was a famous physicist, nuclear physicist, uh, whom we shall refer to once again in this talk. Uh, apparently, he did not participate in the work. Alpha did, George Gamow did this work with his student Alpha. When he wrote the paper, he included Bethe's name. Bethe apparently objected. He said, no, 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 you cannot include my name uh, because I did not contribute. Gamow said, if you don't like, you, you, can, you can sue me. You can go to the court, but I shall include your name. But his aim was to call this the Alpha, Beta, ga of ga Gamma of Cosmology. This is a story, but the serious thing is that he predicted that if the Big Bang model is correct, there should be a relic radiation, relic of the initial uh, high temperature radiation that we had for the Big Bang model in the microwave region. It should have cooled down. His estimation was around 5 degree Kelvin. He called it cosmic microwave background radiation. This should be there. And he predicted that in 1949. I spent quite a lot of time on this slide because this was actually discovered. Penzias and Wilson found a black body radiation in the microwave region. And that estimation, now the correct estimation is not 5 degree, 5 Kelvin. It's around 2.73 Kelvin. Penzias and Wilson were radio astronomers. They were working with some Horn antenna in Bell Lab in Crawford Hill in New Jersey. And they found a, an isotropic radiation, not from any source. So they, they did not realize what's going on. Then some of their, their colleagues pointed out that they, this could be the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, as predicted by Gamow and his co-workers. And it was later proved to be correct. And this is this was in 1965, way back in 1965. Uh, so, but uh, way back from now, but long after uh, George Gamow predicted in 1949. And this discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation seals the fate in favor of Big Bang models. Big Bang models. In this and Wilson, I give you a photograph of them. These two gentlemen standing in front of the horn antenna with which they discovered the CMB. And they got the Nobel Prize as well for this. This is the horn antenna. 
Crawford Hill Bell Lab. So the two pillars of the Big Bang model are one is Hubble's observation that the universe is expanding, and the second is the discovery of the CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation. With these two, it is very difficult to uh, nullify Big Bang model. So this is the basic story of the universe, and this is the basic story of the discovery of the black body radiation whose photograph or whose uh, experimental curve I showed to be an exact, exact uh, replica of the black body radiation as predicted by Planck's law, which was derived nicely by SN Bose with his Bose distribution for Bose-Einstein distribution formula. So, universe is isotropic and homogeneous. Let me do a, 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 bit, uh, a bit critical now. It is isotropic and homogeneous, but at a smaller scale, we see structures. If we look at a scale of 10 to the power 7 light years or more, you will see that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. Everywhere they are the same. But if we look at a smaller scale, we see structure. So anisotrope, so, but this, uh, so, so, so theoreticians can do this. If we have a gravitational system, and if you perturb the system, there is a way that where there is more gravity will accumulate more matter and can form the galaxies and the other part there are a void. So the structures that we see around us can be formed from a homogeneous and isotropic model, but some anisotropy is required for that in the relic CMB uh, that we observe. The required anisotropy is around, around 10 to the power minus 5. That is delta T by T that the temperature of the microwave background radiation is 2.73 Kelvin. The delta T, the anisotropy, amount of anisotropy divided by the actual temperature should be 1 in 10 to the power 5. And so this was predicted. And Kobe, Kobe is not a poet. Kobe is cosmic microwave, cosmic back, background explorer. And it worked on microwave background radiation. Indeed shows that the required, shows the required anisotropy is there in 1992. This is a schematic picture of the cosmic micro cosmic uh, background explorer, and confirmations are pouring in. Much later uh, explorers also, uh, WMAP Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, sending that data from 2003, and the even more recent uh, thing by Planck satellite, which gives you. More recent data from 2000, starting in 2009 to 2013, it was the first mission. Planck is sending data now as well, and he is confirming that this anisotropy of 10 to the power minus 5 is there. Right. So, what we have seen up till now, that 1922 we predicted it from theory Friedman model, we predicted an expanding universe. The universe started from a very bad singular state. Hubble proved that in 1929. We required uh, anisotropy in cosmic microwave background radiation, and we found that later. We, but before, even before that, we predicted the existence of cosmic microwave background radiation, and Penzias and Wilson, um, Penzias and Wilson gave us the, uh, discovered the observe that microwave background radiation. So theory required support, observations obliged. This is important because physics at bottom is an observational science. We do something very, in a very abstract way. But finally, our final results should be supported by observations around. Always not experiments. Experiments meaning you have a controlled experiment you, back, you can go back to your laboratory and do the experiments. Uh, but for the universe, you cannot do the experiment and you cannot change the initial conditions and ask the universe to evolve all, all, all over again. You can't do that. But, but what you can do is that you can observe. At least the observation should, should support your theory. So we have what we have predicted the universe, various things in the universe, and the observations of life. But there's a complete change of story now. 
a complete new turn in cosmology now. So uh, uh, how am I doing in time? It's one hour, right? Uh, Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you have so, uh, another 15 minutes? Maybe? Good, good, good. That's good enough. That's Thank you. Sir. That's good enough. I, I don't think I shall take 15 minutes more. So there is a completely new turn in cosmology now. The dynamics of the universe is governed by gravity, which is attractive. The universe is expanding, but this expansion should have been decelerated. If I throw something like this, uh, anything, let's say a chalk upward, it will go up, but it will stop somewhere because it was decelerating. At some point of time, it will come back. And if I throw it with higher and higher velocities, it stops later. If I throw it with a velocity higher than its escape velocity, it will go. But all the time I, we shall see it, it will lose velocity because the gravity is attractive. The chalk is being attracted by the, by the earth towards its center. So the universe is expanding, but this expansion should have been decelerated. The expansion might have been set in due to some initial condition because I gave the initial velocity to the chalk, so it goes up. So the, for some initial condition, the galaxies are moving away from each other, but, in, but they should have been decelerated. And that was the belief and that was theoretical prediction as well. But now the observation is stunning. The universe is expanding at an accelerated rate, which is absolutely stunning. And this observation came from the supernovae, the burst of a dying star. So I'm not getting into what supernova is all about, but the thing is, for some typical supernova, supernova 1A they call, uh, the classification comes from what elements do you see in this burst. The luminosity is very well known. That was calculated by Hans Bethe. The same Bethe in alpha, Bethe and gamma. And the redshift can be, and the redshift uh, is the measure of the fractional increase in the wavelength, as I said, Z. And Z gives a measure of the distance as well. Right, as we have seen, Z is proportional to D, Hubble's observation. So, and 1 plus Z, Z is the redshift is equal to A0 by A, where A is the present value of the scale factor A, where A, as we have already seen, the scale factor, which gives you the linear size of the universe. And so, as the redshift measure the distance, and, the, and, and you know, that if you have a luminous object and you are observing the in, uh, energy received at a distance, you have the inverse square law. The L, amount of luminosity that, that you receive from some F, the amount of luminosity emitted by the, uh, by the source will be F by D square. So as the luminosity of the supernova is well known and the distance can be measured through redshift, we can, uh, we can, write down the, or we can observe that whether the supernova explosion uh, are giving us good results or not. Supernova explosions appear to be dimmer than their expected. And this can be explained only if we assume that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. These observations are very recent, very, very recent. The first report in 1997, first reports came from these three groups, Palmuter, Schmidt, and Ries, they were all given the Nobel Prize for that. The initial projects were high redshift supernova project based on observations through optical telescope. So well, so we we are facing a great challenge. So the accelerating universe is supported from our other observations as well, namely what is known as the Hubble's observations, the recent observations of the uh, you, what is what is called cosmic chronometer, which measures Hubble's parameter at different length scales, uh, and also so from some acoustic oscillation data, also from the CMB data, cosmic micro background data, they all support this observation from the supernova that the universe is now expanding at an accelerated rate. What is the remedy? What, is, what could be the theori theoretical remedy? We are a bit fortunate at this stage because we chose GR to be the correct theory of gravity and not Newtonian gravity. Why? 
let us see in newtonian gravity the acceleration of an object is given by minus 4 pi g rho into a i have tried to minimize the number of equations but this is a very simple equation g is the newtonian constant of gravity rho is the density of the of a uniformly dense sphere and a is its radius but the respite in gr is this the same equation will be given by a is equal to minus 4 pi g rho plus 3 p times a where p is the pressure not only density but the pressure also contributes to the gravitational acceleration so in newtonian gravity pressure does not contribute but in general relativity it does because pressure gives rise to energy and energy and matter are the same so in relativistic theory pressure also gives rise to gravity the obvious line of attack is try something some kind of a matter which gives rise to rise to a negative pressure is called a dark energy you might have heard the name mind you i should uh, tell you about a, a, a word of caution at this moment sometime you may heard a term called dark matter in cosmology dark matter and dark energy are completely different things matter and energy are the same thing that, that is fine but the dark matter does not it's a name given to some agent which gives rise to negative pressure dark matter is something and by negative pressure it gives rise to dark energy by negative pressure gives rise to a repulsive gravitational effect for gravity the the, the universe will accelerate dark matter you cannot see it that is right in that way it is dark but it gravitates in the usual manner like you me or the sun or the earth or the moon or the galaxies it's normal but dark energy is somewhat different which gives rise to a negative pressure so we have probed the universe beyond the scope of the available theory the completely new turn so far theory always went ahead and the observations followed they supported the theory now the observed universe needs support from theory it all started the observations of the universe all in a scientific way it all started some 400 years ago through the use of telescope in astronomy it was discovered by galileo in 1609 uh, in the optical telescope and from there this ob scientific observation of the universe started and now the observation goes ahead of theory it predicts an accelerated universe and we need to support that to our theory cosmology and maybe i would say all theoretical physics for that matter this is its greatest challenge now because it has to explain the dark energy both in the form of observation uh, and also in the form of theory there are lots of models of dark energy but none is a clear winner everything has some difficulty or other so i have done well in time thank you very much and i shall be ready for the questions thank you thank you so much sir thank you for this wonderful lecture so uh, already we have two question from one of our student shobhi ghosh he is asking that did time run slower gradually after the big bang due to gravity it is his first question the second question is what's the effect of change in the experience of time with the space expanding uh, he is also writing that i have no understanding of gtr asking from the str point of view actually so good question first of all the first question is please repeat the questions one by one first yes. first one is first question is did time run slower gradually after the big bang due to gravity oh well time did not run slower because yeah in in relativity you have kind of a time dilation but what we talk about is a cosmic time which is same for all observers so in that sense that time what i wrote time t to the power two third or t to the power half for the for the expansion of the universe that time t 
that time coordinate is the proper time which is same for all, all observers we call it cosmic time that does not go in, uh, undergo any dilation that is the answer to your first question and this is a very good question uh, for an inhomogeneous universe time would run differently in different places for a homogeneous universe time would run in the same way in the, or at all places and we talked about the homogeneous universe only yes yeah the second question the second question is what's the effect of change in the experience of time with the space expanding no time yeah the proper time does not have i mean it experiences all the evolution of the universe it is uh, i mean it is a spectator of history of the evolution of the universe so time as i said is related to the first question as time does not have a dilation in a homogeneous universe uh, so time remains the same okay thank you sir so there is another question from shohar group sir uh, you said that the galaxies are not static they are moving so there is also yes. a possibility that the some galaxies will move each other and if time goes they will collide after that what will happen this is a good question but see when we talk about cosmology so these are called peculiar velocities yes there could be two stars moving towards each other it's quite common not uh, in our milky way but everywhere it's quite common fortunately our sun is not going towards another sun at the present moment but in future it may well happen uh, so, so some of the galaxies may be coming towards each other but that is called peculiar velocity that has nothing to do that is uh, local perturbation that has nothing to do with the large scale expansion of the universe peculiar velocities are always there that has nothing to do with the cosmic expansion mm -hmm. as we said there are almost 10 to the power 10 galaxies in the universe so two galaxies moving towards each other will not will be averaged out yeah okay thank you sir so there is another question from orpita shen gupta i think it is related to the first two question it so she is basically asking it means we perceive time in two dimension as linear time sorry perceive time in uh, perceive time in two dimension as linear time two dimension meaning what i am not sure time is one dimension so we have a four dimensional space uh, for of this four dimension three are spatial dimensions and one is time dimension if you have two time dimensions you are in a big soup you are in trouble because you will lose causality there is okay. only one time time so we have a space time after the advent of special relativity and relativistic theory we know that the geometry that we talk about is not three dimensional is four dimensional mm -hmm. time is a coordinate and so it has a dimension of its own but single dimensional if you have two dimensions in time they can intersect and you will lose causality okay sir thank you uh, i guess uh, she gets her answer next question from omkita vishwas as everything which has a start has a destined ending too so all these adversities which we are facing is it that we are forwarding towards the end no uh, well yeah it's a good question but uh, but the but it see it depends on the on the rate of acceleration that we have it may so happen that in a finite future the universe will expand i mean the ex rate of expansion will be infinity and the volume of the universe will also be infinity in a, a finite future finite value of t time the age of the universe in that case the galaxies will lose contact with each other so in that case we are gone so but most probable observational observationally is that we shall reach that state only in infinite time only in infinite time for any foreseeable future we still have causal connection with each other galaxies will be visible to each other so uh, yeah at some point of time we shall die but the, the death may be infinitely uh, late so we are not bothering yes 
so this is a question from aishwarya rai so she is asking sir does the model of the expanding universe testify for the universe to expand infinitely as time flows or just a minute i can't see here or the expansion follow a different rate to stop at some point in time yeah it all depends on various kinds of geometries uh so uh, i i was quite sketchy i mean uh, in in the talk but because normally we what we observe is the universe is the space section of the universe is flat if it is flat then the future that i said in the answer to the previous question will still stand if the universe is closed space section is closed space section is closed that is like the like a like a let's say a sphere space section then the universe will recollapse in some time can i can i can i have the question once again yes sir sure so uh, she is asking does the model of the expanding universe testify for the universe to expand in infinitely as time hmm. follows or the expansion follows a different rate to stop at some point in time yeah so yeah so i have answered correctly mostly of what we have seen what uh, i mean as we know through our observation and also theoretically that the universe will expand forever expand forever and it will it will the expansion may stop at some point of time and the universe can recollapse if we have a specially closed geometry like a sphere normally what we uh, assume theoretically and also observations support that we are in a the space section of the universe is flat is like a plane so in that case it will the, her first statement is correct the universe will go on expanding thank you sir uh, another question from shoura rudra sir you said that before big bang there was energy at zero volume that is infinite energy density but mm -hmm. sir before big bang if there was no idea of space and time then how can we define energy density which requires notion of space yeah this is a good question but based on something which i did not say i never said before big bang i said at big bang before big big bang at big bang the time starts the space starts space time starts there was no space no time so how can i say before big bang at big bang the density was infinity when t is equal to 0 i cannot say before big bang the question is right before big bang i cannot say but i did not say as well before big bang is better to be uh, safe better to begin from the beginning and don't try to go beyond yeah so at big bang the density was definitely infinity but before the big bang i never said because i don't know because uh, that is the beginning how, how can i say before that Sir, so another question from Jyotin Moy, uh, sir. If the space expands with different rate or increasing rate, then will the reach of light being limited is a possibility, or is there any counter effect? Yes, yes, of course, yes, of course. Uh, that is that is a major problem in cosmology. It's called the horizon problem. So the universe has expanded, so light has not propagated through the universe. i mean if you look at different directions the they are isotropic they look the same but they might not have causal connection in in the past that is called an particle horizon i mean yeah there there, there is a horizon problem that the universe uh, but there, there may not be causal connection at each point of in future it may so happen that every point in the universe may not have a causal connection with every other point that is right thank you sir uh, sir there are a few more question will you like to take yeah yeah why not okay uh, so another one from shohi uh, he is a bit hesitant but uh, asks that uh, i don't understand the term the start of time from the big bang can you please explain in simple terms so time is a coordinate start of time meaning we cannot think of any time before right 
because let's say uh, let let me give you a not not a proper analogy but a, but an analogy nonetheless uh am i audible still yes sir okay uh, so yeah so is a, a analogy nonetheless think about it's a good question think about uh, how we, how we defined in our childhood an absolute zero in the scale of temperature we have an ideal gas for every degree rise in the temperature 1 by 273 part of its volume decrease, uh, increases so if we go in the other direction if we decrease the temperature so 1 by 273 part of its volume will decrease so at minus 273 degree centigrade the volume will become zero practically what happens even before that the gas will liquefy and then solidify it will not be a gas but anyway even theoretically if we can proceed at minus 273 degree centigrade the volume of the gas will be zero so can we decrease the temperature further no because the volume will be negative so that is the theoretical limit of the temperature we cannot go even below that because the volume will become negative right so if the universe the volume of the universe is zero at some point of time we have to call this to be the start of time if we go below that time the volume of something will be negative which is not possible as simple as that so when the volume was zero we cannot go below that time and that time is called the beginning of time the clock starts ticking okay sir thank you i guess uh, it's clear uh, let me see if there is any other question mm. Comments on that as you are expert in, I mean, homogeneous. I mean, also. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in, yeah, yeah, in homogeneous universe. See, at some scale, the universe is in homogeneous. Is no doubt, but at large scale, still the people are people will believe that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Fractal universe, many people are doing. In fact, in fact, in in order to explain the present accelerated expansion, also. there are some school there is some school of thought led by one of uh, our old guy i mean our old friend subir da subir sarkar i know him who is in oxford he says that this results from the local inhomogeneity of the universe so this acceleration of the universe is also from 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 the inhomogeneity of inhomogeneity of the universe rather than the uh, it's a real real accelerated expansion but uh, that does not have much of the experimental support subhida will say uh, differently but most of the people will still believe in a homogeneous universe and not a new inhomogeneous universe at some point of time in the early this century 2000 or somewhat before that 1990 something like that fractal universe came very strongly fractal universe but now uh people are not quite uh have uh, uh, faith in this kind of fractal universe yeah they can be there can be fractals in some chunks of the universe at a much smaller scale but not at the large scale okay so there is some uh, there there were some observations also some people said that the said, said that there there is a periodicity in the galaxy distribution as well in fact i also worked i did not talk about any fractal structure that there but if there is a periodicity in the galaxy distribution that tells you about the fractal structure of the universe but hubble constant the cosmic microwave background radiation the two most um, 
pillar, most important pillars of the Big Bang model or the cosmological models, they don't show any oscillations or fractal structure. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, last one question from one of another, another student, uh, Indira. She's asking, can dark energy destroy black hole? Not really, not really. The question is not very irrelevant because black holes, how do black holes form? They form due to the collapse of matter. When there is no pressure, the matter will gravitationally collapse to form black hole and dark energy gives rise to and a repulsive gravity and acceleration, so it will repel. So black holes cannot destroy, uh, sorry, uh, dark energy cannot destroy black holes because dark, dark energy is primarily a cosmological phenomena, is in the, found in the large scale. At a smaller scale, where there are inhomogeneities, black, gravitational collapse will still occur and black holes will fall. But the question is relevant. Because black holes, uh, due, black holes form due to focus of matter, and dark energy gives defocusing. Yeah, but there is a difference in scales. Black holes do not, uh, sorry, dark energy do not uh, distribute themselves in any scale below the Hubble scale. It's uniform all over, not in homogeneous. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for answering all the questions. I hope all the participants get their answer. So if there is no more question, so I will request uh, Professor Aparajita Bhattacharya to please end the session with a vote of thanks. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Purva. Um, so first of all, um, it's a wonderful talk and it's the time to give formal thanks. Uh, my sincere heartfelt thanks to Professor Naren Banerjee for such an informative and enlightening uh, 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 talk. And it's our wonderful journey to one hour journey to um, the mystery of the universe and our desperate attempt to understand the mystery of the universe, in fact, I should say. So thank you, sir, for coming here and giving us time. Uh, and uh, it's it's a really very very uh, very very interesting talk. Uh, next, I want to uh, give thanks to our dean, sir, Professor Dipankar Bhattacharya, for his constant uh, uh, support, uh, and um, also our head of the department, Momita Dev, uh, and his her own whole whole team for this kind of academic activity. And there is a uh, lots of academic activity going on in the de department under her guidance. I special thanks to uh, Purva for uh, beautiful comparing this whole program and also Papia uh, for, as the arranging this wonderful talk. Um, I am uh, also thankful to all the participants finally who are the most important focus of this kind of event and without their participation, it is it will never be so successful. I'm thankful to our IT teams who have arranged all this technical success or technical help. And it's a really wonderful talk. And Professor Banerjee, we were looking forward to see you in our campus. Yes, and sir. With tea and some things in the talk, and that will be much more enjoyable, direct content. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you thank all. You for this session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So should I sign off now? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank the you. wonderful uh, atmosphere. Thank so you. So I was not confident about this uh, online kind of talk. But anyway, I had no, to... No, no. It goes some... very well, sir. Yeah. <laughs> it's very well. Thank you. It's a never-ending topic. So lots of questions... When it is comes the universe, the question of universe understanding, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Dean is only, only there, sir. Would you like to say something? Our dean, sir, is. Yes, sir. Sure, uh, thank you, you, like thank you sir. I, I was uh, uh, just uh, seeing it for some time, but. Uh,
I had another meeting. That was my problem. I always miss things. Yeah. So, okay. But I was looking at it. Uh, the presentation also. I was looking at it. I was. Uh, but sometimes I was there, and I missed again. Every time I miss. But thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank okay. You. Thank you, sir. Okay. Let us let us end the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Participants' feedback link already shared in chat box. Please fill it up and generate your certificate. It is already shared several times. Okay, ma'am. So we can leave now, na? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ito amra dani jai tuva dini. Ha, ami da wetu. I'm waiting. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.